I was very intimidated. And I was like, I was talking to myself. I was like, I don't have to be intimidated because I am at the same level as Kiefer Sutherland. I just have two lines, but my two lines are at the same believability level as his 5,000 lines. Or <laughs> You know what I mean? Like every day player is chosen because they're the best who went for that. And like they are believable. And that's the only currency we need is to be believable and on par with everybody else for that little moment or two moments or three scenes or 10 scenes that you have. I think that's very empowering for a starting actor starting out to kind of like, Okay, you're not a day player. You're a day star. <laughs> Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Julian Kostov is an actor. He sat down with me in cyberspace from Sofia, Bulgaria to talk about the work. You didn't have, like, a family member that was an actor. And you didn't have, like, a teacher that fostered your talent into acting. Like, uh, people like you who end up <laughs> in this profession, I find fascinating because there's no, there was no really traditional roads that were open to you in a way. I mean, no, no more than anybody else that has absolutely no connections to anything. So... Take me through the beginning of you wanting to do this and what were the paths that you made for yourself? Well, I think in retrospect, now that I think about it, it, it like I, I was always a storyteller and like as a kid, I would just play with my um, little soldiers that I had, like toy soldiers, and I would like direct basically plays and um, they all have relationships with each other and like I would play for hours like uh, my great grandpa got rest his soul he uh, he was he there's this famous story that my my parents keep telling me uh, my grandparents actually and he's like he he would say when is uh, Yuli coming that's my that's how you call me for short to say when's Yuli coming and they were like no he was <laughs> he was in the corner of the room this whole time the whole day and he's like really and he, I was just playing with my toys and like he was like what a quiet kid and I was like yeah <laughs> I was just like in my own film you know in my own zone yeah 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 and I think um uh in in high school I was a bit kind of like um all of a sudden I was a bit uh, bullied and like I wasn't a popular kid so it kind of Years later, I kind of dealt with that in in the acting studio, which I'm going to talk about. But um, uh, I guess my kind of light that I had, um, my fire was kind of put out for for a, a bit of my my teenage years, and my self esteem and my self uh, self expression was um, kind of muted by by those um, um, kids. And so, um, as I redeveloped, you know, my confidence and all that stuff, I actually was it's one of those lives where my you know my, my mom's a judge and my dad's a businessman he has a logistics business so it was always on the cards I would do something serious like law or yeah and I was like I don't think any kid at age 19 or barely any kid knows what they want to do yeah. with their lives and I was like okay what what's gonna be uh less time consuming and uh I'm you know and I was like, yeah, business sounds easy, so I'll just do business. <laughs> and I and I so I um, I enrolled in some program in uh, the Netherlands uh, in a city called Tilburg, and uh, I went to live there, and it was so depressing. And I watched a lot of movies, and uh, just stayed in bed all day, and almost developed asthma from being like a, a professional swimmer, part of my nas national team in Bulgaria. Oh wow! And I uh -huh. I kind of dropped all that because I was so depressed, and I never really loved swimming that much, and I. Um, you know, I didn't want to go to the Olympics and be 57th and, <laughs> and like, yeah, yeah, yeah for yeah. something that I don't love if I loved it. Sure. But, um, and so I kind of watching over and over again, like the dark Knight and Heath Ledger's performance in the dark Knight. just, I was so obsessed with him and with his performance. And I watched it so many times that I learned the lines and back then we didn't have selfie cams. So I just kind of started self recording myself with the, <laughs> the other camera uh -huh, and I was uh -huh. like, Ooh, all right, this acting thing. What? It's like it never occurred to me. I was at age twenty-one. I was like, being an actor is a profession that I could possibly do and undertake, maybe. So I was like, that's weird. 
And I've always been a major cinephile and especially sci-fi and fantasy. And like, the, I would know The Matrix by heart and I'm Neo and I'm, you know, Luke Skywalker and Anakin. And <laughs> I would be so obsessed with Lord of the Rings. And But I never, because because they were all in English language and there was never anybody who had my kind of name or came from my, my background. There was not one yeah. star or even one mediocrely successful person that we would know about who's a Bulgarian or even like a Russian or like a Polish or Eastern European person yeah. that, um, that I would I can point to and be like, oh, this I could do that. So at, at a later age, at 21, I was like, shit, okay, I can I can try this. And then my parents and everybody was like, you know, basically the same argument. There's nobody in Hollywood who's successful and is an Eastern European, born and raised here, da, 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 they don't like us. And I'm like, I don't know. I, Okay, I'll be the first one then. <laughs> if it hasn't been done, who's to say that it can't be done? That's a stupid sentence. Yes. And so I moved to London. I was in Holland second year, and I moved my credits secretly from my family at that point. And I was like, I'm going to try and be an actor, see if, I, see if I'm good at it. Or... <laughs> and so I had no clue how it works. I, 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 didn't, I didn't even have any friends who were in the business. So I, I, I literally couldn't ask anybody. So here I am in London. I graduated business management. I burned my diploma in like a crazy wow. metaphor. Um, um, literally burned it. I literally burned literally. it. It was like, burn the bridges, you know, burn the boats. Uh, yeah. You can't have yeah. a plan B. If you have a plan B, you're not going to be serious about plan A. And I'm like, I'm here to be an actor. I <laughs> came out as an actor to my parents and they were like, what are you talking about? You're a shy, shy kid, like shy guy. What you? And I, I literally couldn't even deliver a pre presentation uh, in my university um, uh, without having cobweb mouth and like, sweaty palms and different like, muscle different yeah. muscle though right yeah. totally different robert de niro can't either <laughs> <laughs> yes to this day <laughs> but i definitely had to you know uh for a long time i thought you know I, I would listen to these crazy stories of people being noticed spotted on the street and then they became movie stars bullshit and uh and so for the first seven days i would walk around london uh, in, in rainy October days covered in this huge hoodie and like with a spotted face and like I would be <laughs> waiting to be spotted and after you know I caught a cold I was like you know what maybe that's not the way it happens and I was like I'm smart London's a big city so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna become an extra in a <laughs> in a movie and then the director is gonna spot me obviously that's their job right to spot right. talent they right, can't right, miss right, me right, right, right. <laughs> and so uh <laughs> Later on, you know, I became an extra for a tandoori commercial in London, uh, for a tandoori restaurant commercial in London. And then I didn't get spotted. And then I realized I might have to put in some work and get some training. Uh, and that's how I found through a, a randomly on the on the tube. Um, I was I saw uh, this newspaper and it said National Youth Theater of Great Britain, you know, enrolling people. And uh, and I read and like everybody, Orlando Bloom and, and Helen Mirren and like all the greats, like Kenneth Branagh, uh, everybody went through that kind of um, National Youth Theater thing. And I was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. I went and I auditioned and I kind of prepared on my own. I had to choose a monologue. And I remember, it's probably the most uh, work I've put in into something, but uh, I had this monologue that I pulled out of the internet. And then between every line, I wrote my thoughts about how I feel about that line. And I memorized my thoughts and my lines and I went and did that monologue yes. and I think I even had a little tear and I was like, dude, I'm acting. It's like a real. And then so four months later, they told me I was admitted. It was like from 5,000 kids. They only took 150 kids and then you pay and then you have a wow. two week course and then you're part of the National Youth Theater and you can apply for their plays and stuff. But I was always very intimidated by theater. And I also like didn't think it's realistic that with kind of a mongrel accent at the time that I had that they would even consider me for any role in theater. And so I, I randomly started learning about, you know, agents and like years later I learned about casting directors. And so I, I got my first agent and he got me one audition in for the whole year. And then I got my second agent and he got me a Gillette commercial that I booked. And I was like the Gillette boy. I wouldn't call myself a man <laughs> even now, but <laughs> it was. And so like little by little, uh, I, I did, you know, I decided I need to perfect my American accent and kind of be a, a professional fake American because I thought that's going to be my niche. Because, uh, you know, it was still unheard of having a normal, decent role for an Eastern European um, in, in the Western cinema and TV. You know, you'd always be the goon or whatever. But um, mm. 
Yeah, so I, I did some movies back home where I played an American soldier as like lead roles and I had no idea what I was doing. I was literally an extra on a Jack Ryan set and then uh, like number four on a call sheet on this uh, $2 million zombie movie in Bulgaria where I played US uh-huh. military. But basically that learning by doing was kind of my way. I did a lot of short films at the beginning that I was so bad. <laughs> I was so shit at them. I used different uh, pr- uh, um, stage names. <laughs> so I can, uh, but I was so bad, but I, I, w- I would watch them and be like, you know what? I like this acting thing. I'll learn it. You know, I think it's something you can learn. So I had that mindset of, even though I'm super shit, I'm probably the worst actor I've ever seen. I I'll learn it. I'll, I'll study. So seeing, seeing yourself so bad, it didn't discourage you to the point of not wanting to continue. It actually in the opposite way, it made you want to learn. Like, yeah. like it seems like a, like an important point there. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, because I, I burned my diploma. I had no plan B anymore. So <laughs> I had to learn. <laughs> right, I had already, right. I was like, you know, right. the rebel without a cause that went, you know, and I'm not going to come work for the family business. I'm not going to do business. I'm going to be an actor. Surprise. Right. But I don't get me wrong. I was depressed about how bad I was. I just thought, you know what? I'll I'll push through because what matters the most for me was that um, I was having fun. Um, I thought. I mean, yes. Later, I, I got better and better. I think, and <laughs> and then after I did these two uh, feature films uh, in Bulgaria, where they basically booked me because uh, I was the cheapest American option, who <laughs> who wasn't you know somebody recommended me, and it was like a very random thing. I have to thank the casting director for that um, and some friends, but it, it was my way in. It was my foot in the door, and uh, mm-hmm. I would get paid three hundred dollars mm-hmm. per day. And I was like, "I'm a real actor! I can't believe it!" <laughs> I was so excited, you know, showing up to set every day, and uh, it was scary as hell. But to, to be honest, to this day, I'm scared on every set I set foot. Like the first hour or the first day is always, um, you know, I feel like I have to prove myself over and over again every time, not yeah. just to yeah. the director and the crew, but to myself and the fellow actors, but to myself. And I think Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep, like they talk about stuff like that. And Hugh Jackman always says like every other movie, I'm terrified because people are going to figure out I'm a bad actor. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. no, you're not. You're mm-hmm. amazing. But he thinks that, right? We all, all right. think, I think we have that imposter syndrome and and I think the, 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 the way I deal with it is just I keep reminding myself that it's a normal thing that everybody goes through. All the people that I admire go through it. So it's just breathe. And I think breathing is so <laughs> underrated. And it's so simple. Like we're here on this earth to breathe. And this is what, what acting is as well. Like when I kind of implemented that in my, my own, like in my in my life as well, I do it all the time. Like if I... If I feel anxious, I'm like, just ground yourself, breathe deep through your belly and like realize that, you know, the five, five rule, it's, it's not, if you're not going to remember, it's not, if it's not going to matter in five years, why worry more than five minutes about it right now? So I never heard that. I love that. Oh yeah. It's really, it's, it's really fun <laughs> when you're like, actually do, you know, it's, and that's my other, you know, when I, when I feel worried about something, I just like to look at the stars in London. It's hard because you barely see the stars ever, but <laughs> you try to imagine, you know, how, how, how short, like what a short time we're here for. And really yeah. are my, all my fears and doubts and like worries relevant or do they matter? Like just stop thinking, stop, stop taking myself seriously. Cause I think that's the, the the trap with this job is to think that it's heart surgery and and it kind of is but it also isn't you know what i mean like it's right. important what we do but it's everything is important with what every person does like what right. matters is not so much what you do but that you do it with joy and that you do it with dedication i think uh, and so i found my thing and it's i guess acting and creating and helping others especially as well is there something that you started doing with auditioning that uh, helps in that same way that the breathing thing, you know what I mean? Like, was there a, was there an approach that you started to develop yeah. inside the room or whatever? Maybe there's not a room anymore or just something that you <laughs> yeah. do that you, that started, started working for you. The room is gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's bad in the sense that you can't get direction that I think sometimes at home you, you, you know, you have your people you feel comfortable with and you don't feel like you're yes. wasting their time because you're going to do them a favor as well. But yeah, I, there was this 
thing that Brian Cran is very famous. Brian Cranston say it says it about Malcolm in the Middle and like his struggling for a long time and didn't book anything. It's be- and he says, you know, uh, once I realized I'm not there to get a job, I'm there to do a job. That's when it yes. and it's super yes, it clicked for that. me so hard. I was like, shit, that is deep. And so, Just what is an performance? Opportunity to work, yeah, yeah, man. Like, and we're talking about the work, right? It's like exactly that. You get normally when you get a job, you have like what. Uh, a month, t- a month to film it, and you have a few weeks to prep or two months to prep, um, and and you know maybe a thousand or ten thousand or hundred thousand people are going to watch it, or you're going to do a play, and it doesn't matter if it's a play at a pub or if it's a play at the National Theater, you're still going to give it your all, right? So why not have that same approach about uh, who cares if you're getting paid? I'm not doing this because I'm getting paid. At the end of the day, I'm I'm getting paid to wait around. I'm not getting paid to act. Right. I don't feel like you know. So if an audition is uh, is an opportunity for me to research a character for three days and and some literature, and then uh, play it for fifteen minutes in front of an audience of one, two, or three people or ten people, then w- I'm happy. You know what else? After I and I used to be so hung up on getting the role, of course. Um, and I would be devastated when I when I didn't like I had some uh, big auditions that led like that you know like Star Wars for the role of Finn and like Star Wars is my life so I was like oh, oh shit wow. it's meant to be and, yeah. and I had like four auditions over the course of three or four months and <sighs> me and a hundred other people but yeah little did I know that and so I was heartbroken for like seven months. And then I saw, the, I bet I saw the, um, cause I had a 40 minute audition at Nina Gold's office and, uh, with Kate Bone, an amazing casting director. And, you know, she would try and give me that humor line and I couldn't get it. And I mean, this was 2014. So I wasn't even trained yet, uh, at the studio. Mm. So I, I had an idea of how to play it. And I went there with my idea. I couldn't take direction really well, uh, especially the humor mm. note. And when I saw John Boyega, I was like, Oh, okay. That's what they meant. <laughs> Yeah, I see. see. And you, you know, with good casting, you can always see why the other person got it. Sometimes, um, you know, n- right now when I, I always watch, I try to watch the things that I didn't book that I thought I was right for. And I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Or, okay, they did the same thing. It's just a choice of, you know, um, he's more yeah. famous or type. something like that. Something, or type yeah. or, you know, or I reminded the casting director of her ex-boyfriend who she hated. I don't know. You know, right, they, they right, and that's, it's, that's real. I'm sure these. that's real. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, sometimes Paul Haggis tells the story that you know he turned down some very famous actor because she's a blonde and he needed a brunette and he hates wigs. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> All right, crazy, crazy. <laughs> it could be as simple as that. But how did you get over that though? I mean, that because if when you go in four times. How, what is the process of recovery? I mean, and, and, and did you learn something from that recovery process? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I learned that it's not personal. And I also learned, because I was very like, <laughs> I was a bit like listening to Eminem going to the audition and it's like, you only got one chance to blow. This opportunity comes once in a lifetime. You better. <laughs> and I didn't lose myself fully in that moment, like M said, but... Um, yeah. but what I realized it's, it's, it's a metaphor. You don't get one shot. You got multiple shots and, uh, it's a process. It's a ladder and you have to go through. And I, I'm so grateful that I didn't book that. Um, first of all, because there's so many more star Wars things that I could do, but also I would have been a, probably a brat if I got that at, at that age. I'm not saying that right. 23 is young. I'm saying that I was young at 23 and I had, I didn't mm-hmm. struggle enough. And now I realize it. I had to, mm-hmm. you know, I was somebody who like acted in a couple of movies and never did any training and auditioned like seven times. And all of a sudden what I'm going to be a lead on star Wars. Mm-hmm. I would have been so ungrateful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Right. Right. Um, and like, I've had those heartbreaks a few times after the period of mourning keeps getting shorter and shorter to the point where you get desanitized a little bit. And yeah. You know, because it's so weird, like with this career that after my, after I did Another Mother's Son, uh, which is a drama, I play a real person from the Second World War. Uh, Incredible performance. Care. Thank you. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I thought, well, after that, I mean, you know, the producers were so inspired and they were like, oh yeah, you're going to win a BAFTA and a BIFA and it's going to be amazing. And I, you know, I did get good reviews and, and, and the movie did okay. And I didn't work for two years after that. 
Isn't that amazing? So amazing, it, right? Isn't it crazy? And amazing. of course I got resentful. But but wait, there's a there there's a there's a breakthrough that happened before that. Oh yeah. That movie, right? I want you to tell that story of that breakthrough you had before another mother's son. So I went to Anthony Mindell's actor workshop, which is a very famous, very one of the best studios in LA. And he's got studios in New York and Atlanta and Sydney and London. So I, uh, in 2014, right around after I got <laughs> dropped for Finn in Star Wars, I was like, I, I was like, okay, maybe I need some training. <laughs> Maybe, just maybe. <laughs> I'm not Jennifer Lawrence yet. Um, so, <laughs> and so I started going to an acting studio and I was so bad and so shy because like I was on stage for the first time and, um, and like, even Mitchell, my, my teacher at the time, he was like, really, this guy, <laughs> this, this is the hot shot? <laughs> it's really bad. Um, totally blocked. Um, and so in that studio, maybe I need to give some context that we work with code reading. The idea is not to know the text and barely mm -hmm. know the scene. You just have one shot to read it outside for 10 minutes and then you come in and you do it. Mm -hmm. Um, you pick a partner at random on the day and you do a scene at random. Maybe you picked it, maybe they picked it. So you're basically almost unfamiliar with it or barely familiar with it. And the idea is that, you know, he's going to side coach you and if you're too much in your head and playing the idea of the scene and the character and the relationship and not the relationship that's unfolding mm -hmm. on stage with your particular partner. Cause every partner is mm -hmm. different. Every time you do the scene is different. It has to be different. Otherwise it's not truthful. And mm -hmm. so that's what they kind of tried to instill at us in this kind of don't make it anti-intellectual. It's kind of like an anti-method. Like who, like you don't go around, you know, walking around, it was like, I need this today in this, you know, you don't do right, it in life. Right. You know, I have this want or this need. You kind of know what you want and need and you use multiple tactics to get it out of the moment. You kind of judge your partner. You have your eyes, you have your ears and listening with your whole body. It's just not, it's not, it's not just listening with your ears. It's, you know, it's with your energy, with your kinetic, um, with your body, with your um, everything, it, it, even a smell that's listening too. Um, we were working a lot on my blockages and they kind of work with you on, on your personal stuff as well. And you kind of, mm. you work out your personal stuff through, it's like drama therapy, I guess, uh, psychodrama mm. or whatever it's called. Um, and I, one of the first blockages that I remember was I couldn't, I have the scene where I'm supposed to be fighting with my girlfriend and in the scene, I have to say, uh, something like, well, you're a bitch or like something. And because I never stood up for myself in my own relationships up to that point, mm -hmm. I couldn't do it on stage. And the teacher stopped me and I said the line and he stopped me and he was like, well, fuck you, bitch, is the line. And then he's like, Julian, stop. And I'm like, I can't break eye contact. He's just side coaching me and I just have to listen mm -hmm. to him. And he's like, look at your body language. I look down and I'm leaning on my back foot. I'm backing out of the fight and the scene mm -hmm. is about fighting. Like there's no scene about backing out of the fight. You got to fight. Mm -hmm. And so I shifted my weight forward and I was like, okay, I see what you mean. He's like, well, why is that? And I kind of like, well, that's how I am in life. And he's like, we don't want to see that shit here. So <laughs> work through that. And, uh, and so I was like, yeah, you bitch. And then I was like in the fight and you know, it took me many sessions to kind of fully, you never, I think fully actually, you know, you always have every day you wake up a different person based on the experience you had the day before that mm -hmm. it, you know, enriches your new understanding of the world and your emotional right. um, current situation. But I worked a lot on that. And then one of the other things, as I told you, I I've worked on this accent before it became a natural accent. I would listen to Hank Moody and <laughs> from California mm. and just repeat because I didn't have money for accent classes. And, um, because I thought nobody's, you know, my way through is as an American. There's no way there's going to be ever a role uh, for an Eastern European that's meaty enough. And then my tea, I was doing this Holocaust scene with a mother character. So it was me and my mom, um, this amazing actress called Patty. And we were doing the scene, and I was American again. And I was like, and my teacher was like, no, no, like you're too cool. They keep they kept telling me I'm too cool for school. And I didn't know what that meant until that day kind of clicked after like two years of grinding at the studio. Um, he's like, stop, stop. 
Julian, you're too cool again. Like, do it as a scared, lonely ass boy. He's from Boston. He's like, scared, lonely ass boy. And I was like, yeah, but like this scene, like, you know, he's strong. He's like, no, he's like you. This is you. You're a scared, lonely ass boy. Why don't you admit that to yourself finally? And I'm like, and he's like, and also do it in a Bulgarian accent. And I'm like, and that was too cool for school again. I was like, well, no, I have to put on a Bulgarian accent. I don't talk like that. It, it get me even more in my head. Mm. And he's like, shut up, just do it. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so I did it. And he just said it again. You're scared, lonely ass boy from Bulgaria. You're far away from your parents. You're like, this is your mom. Like, wow. you're about to die. And, and you're, you should be scared. Like, who wouldn't be? Get over yourself. And so all of a sudden, it clicked for me. And I gave one of those scenes where you kind of feel you kind of feel like the inspiration is a storm and you hear it mm. and you just kind of have to hook on to it and then you and it just it, it, it drives you and you you do the act like it does the acting for you there's no acting really necessary you're like feeling it mm. all and i was like wow and then after every scene we have a, a talk back where we you know uh, um, a check-in where you kind of like what did you learn like from this experience and i was like wow i mean this was really a breakthrough and what I what I learned from it is that I need to embrace my Bulgarianness and my my heritage, and that there's nothing wrong with me being from Bulgaria, and that yes. fuck the industry if they don't want to accept that. I'm just yes. here to do the work, and and doing the work means that I have to embrace the whole of myself uh, to be able to access those pockets of you know um, parts of myself that I need to 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 be able to free. It's more about I don't think of it as like I'm going to play a character, but it's more of that part of myself that is similar or has kind of rings true with the character that I'm doing. Mm. There always has to be something that grounds me from me. But if if the access to that emotional part of myself is blocked, that's when you get shit acting, I think. Right. It's when you're not ready to face your own demons through the role. There's right. you know, there's an amazing actor uh, that I the, from the studio that I know and uh, she can do any scene amazing except scenes with older men because she has problems with hmm. her dad and she just wow. blocks out you can't get any emotion from her so she worked on that in the studio wow. Wow. so it's really it's a really interesting and individual way of, of, of approaching acting that they do in that yeah. studio that I really really connected with you're making me think that when you are blocked and you are doing a shit job in a scene it might actually be if you can unblock it, you'll do better than almost anyone else who doesn't do shit in that because that means that the blockage, once it's unblocked, you'll have all of this, like you called it, the storm behind it. Yeah. It's actually could be if you're not connecting or not doing it right, it could be that you have something to offer that as if you can get it unblocked that other people might not be able to that's amazing well i mean it's always you right and you're so like i think all of us it, talking about it metaphysically if you want or spiritually but i think all of us have all of humanity in us and that's why mm. we can we could literally do any role um but you have to be able to access that part of humanity if you want or, or human experiences because there's so much encoded in us in our dna you know why can you it's so weird to me why can i imagine what it feels to be stabbed why can i imagine what it feels to be mm. shot like it, it, at some level my cells maybe know what it feels like so mm, uh, and, right. and obviously they did mri scans of actors who were um, you know, pretending they're feeling emotions and it would, um, uh, the, the brain will light up the same way as people having those emotions for real. That's crazy. And that's, that's fucking crazy. scary and crazy. <laughs> <That's> crazy. <laughs> so the brain doesn't know, like the, I think it's always, it's so weird. I don't know if the thought is came first or the feeling, but <laughs> scientifically I can't, but it's, it's, they kind of, to me, it's like the chicken and the egg. They're they're both at the, you know. If you can imagine it, then it's really happening, and and that's right. why I don't really believe so much. I uh, I don't really do emotional recall. Like I don't I don't want to think about something bad that I don't need to, um, mm. because because I can imagine it, and mm -hmm. it, if I imagine it, boom, I'm there. And if I'm really 
you know, I think through the eyes of my partner, like what I really struggle actually, or I used to struggle with uh, talking to the wall. Like I really want somebody with me in there because I take yeah. it all from them, you know, and they, they're charging my performance. And that's why yeah. I always give like even more of a performance behind the camera when I'm, when I'm reading, you know, when they're doing their close up, because I know how important it is. And I know they'll get, they're probably going to give it back to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think it's always about your partner and listening and responding to what they're doing. They could do it a different way. And, and if they're really listening and when you shock them sometimes in a scene, I think that's really cool. But I was going to say that after I kind of realized, I accepted and embraced my true self, uh, my full self, um, and, um, and, and stopped feeling shame about who I am. Um, literally the next day, uh, I manifested a role, the role in another mother's son. I've never, ever had an audition Crazy. like that in my entire life. And I almost missed it. I saw it on the day that I was supposed to submit the deadline. And I, I had missed the email first time in my life. So there was, maybe there was like still this thing. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Mm. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. And I saw it. I, I almost didn't tape it. I taped it and I always tape. I don't know why, why I had that. You see, this is the resistance we're talking about. The resistance is always going to try and slow you down and block you and mm -hmm. make, you know, and that's what I guess what we say when we talk about choices, not only in the scene, but also in your career, you always have to choose things that scare you. And, yes. um, and that role was very scary, but every, everything I did, every scene I did was at a, at the, uh, at, at the pole of like, at some emotional pole. Like I was either yeah. super scared or super sad or very angry or yeah. I, I literally pissed myself in one scene um, because I'm, I'm scared of the Nazis and, and yeah. you know, the things they did to me. And I lost 10 kilos, I think, uh, of, wow. that's what, 20 something pounds is it? Wow. I don't know. Wow. Uh, in like a couple of weeks. And this is what I strive to be. And one day when I, you know, hopefully have a show of my own and I, or a movie that I'm leading again, that I want to, I want every actor to feel very comfortable on set because that's, Half of acting is just being comfortable, relaxed, and confident. And then confidence comes from being relaxed. Um, you know, we've been you've been chosen because you have you're of the same level of acting with everybody else. That's how I mm -hmm. well, actually when I did Twenty Four is one of my first jobs with Kiefer Sutherland. Mm -hmm. I and I for the first time I got a real trailer and like half Pall Mall was um, you know full of the Twentieth Century Fox trailers and I was one of them and. I was going to act with Yvonne Strahovski and Kiefer Sutherland and the show that I was watching with my dad, like throughout my, uh, when I was a kid. <laughs> and so it, I was like, I don't need to be intimidated. I was very intimidated. And I was like, I was talking to myself. I was like, I don't have to be intimidated because I am at the same level as Kiefer Sutherland. Mm -hmm. I just have two lines, but my two lines are at the same believability level as his 5,000 right. lines or <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like right. every day player is chosen because they're the best who went for that. And like they are believable right. and that's the only currency we need is to be believable and on par with everybody else for that little moment or two moments or three scenes or 10 that's scenes right. that you have. I think that's very empowering for a starting actress starting out to kind of like, okay, you're not that. a day player. You're a day star. <laughs> At the same time that you are trying to break in, though, you're you're beginning to help other people. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it, it, I mean, tell me what your mindset is like. You know, mo most people <laughs> can't deal with just helping themselves, <laughs> and you have this whole attitude about trying to get, particularly you know, Eastern European actors, yeah, fighting for them to have a a, a chance in this in this crazy business. Yeah. I mean, talk to me about this. I think it came from like one of those conversations in studios and, and, and it was this one phrase that stuck with me, which was, um, that you can't really make room for new ideas in your mind. If you don't let go of the other knowledge and ideas that you already have, that is no, mm -hmm. in, that isn't useful to you anymore. So don't hold on to, knowledge and ideas but always share it so you can make space for new things to come in because otherwise and it makes total sense to me um <laughs> metaphysically again or whatever spiritual spiritually but i was like you know what this whole 
like headbanging that I've had to go through with all these crazy platforms that I've looked for short films and like student films to get my show reel and what is it to have an agent and how do you write a cover letter and what, what are the do's and don'ts and all that stuff. So I started like giving consultations and like helping. Well, actually, I just started, uh, it started with my best friend who who came over as well to become an actor. So I, he, he was like uh, um, the first person who I kind of tried, you know, gave all that I knew and like all the little shortcuts that, you know, it takes two or three years to kind of, if you don't know what you're doing. And in Bulgaria, there's no agencies, like basic, barely anywhere in Eastern Europe there, is there an agency. So people kind of negotiate mm. themselves and um, they don't understand why you would get, they would give you 10%. Uh, and like, who are these casting directors? Like people just, theaters talk directly to actors and, uh, and you know, there, there are some casting directors here, but mostly it's the directors go to the drama school and then they pick people or you work with people mm. you know. Um, so there's really not this infrastructure here. And as I said, there's no kind of role model to look up to. And these two kids, actually, uh, these twins, Chris, Chris and, uh, Iskren, uh, Pev, um, they, um, they were models and I kind of met them in this thing in Bulgaria. I, was, I don't know where I was doing something, shooting something here. And, uh, they were like, Oh my God, you're, you're him. I'm like, who? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're a sane person, you never take yourself seriously. I'm like, what? What did I do? He's like, <laughs> he's like, well, you're the actor, right? You know, I'm like, I am an actor. And so they were like very excited about meeting me, and they were like, yeah, we we. They had the same conversation I had with my parents about there not being a Eastern European that they could look up to or a Bulgarian that they could mm. look up to, in in the Western kind of TV and cinema world. And their and their parents were like, no, why? You know. Uh, we have another saying in Bulgaria, a musician doesn't feed your home or your family or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a terrible one. That's terrible. No, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Usually sayings at least have some kind of, you know, sense to it. Well, that's yeah. just bad. <laughs> that's just bad. <laughs> it comes from care. You don't want your kids something. Like right. Guess, but it's such yeah. a bad one. Um, um, a musician doesn't feed house, basically, directly. Uh, uh -huh. um, and so... Their parents told them that because they were studying business again. And they were like, well, no, there's this one guy, Julian Gustav, who, who yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. and they were like, oh, yeah, well, uh, okay, I guess you do it. <laughs> and so they had convinced their parents to, to, to help to, you know, pay their, awesome. their tuitions and all that. And, and they went into and they got admitted to a drama school in London. That's and now amazing. they graduated and they ended up living next to me and Martin. Yeah. And so we kind of took it upon us to mentor them and just... Um, which is a fun process because you sometimes when people are not ready to hear what you're telling them, they're like, they need to make their own mistakes. Basically, is what they what I learned mm. from this process. Sometimes mm. you just can't really teach, mm -hmm. force feed them everything, and you have to be patient, and you just have to basically love them and care for them. It's not so much yeah. about you know and being there for when they're disappointed and all that stuff, but they'll do well. And and my always I I thought one bird doesn't make a spring. So I'm going to help more birds yeah. and we can, you know, be a, um, a flock of yeah. birds who are, you know, yeah, showing yeah, how yeah. talented we are. Cause there's so many talented people in Bulgaria that yeah. I started this acting management agency to help other, as you said, Bulgarian and Eastern European actors and other international people. And, uh, I have an agent who like, I don't do any of that, but I have a, a very awesome agent, Maribela Bravo, who, who runs the agency and I just help with some stuff and, you know, management kind of mentory things every now and again. Um, but that's how Maria Bakalova got the role for Borat uh, because Amazing. Nancy Bishop reached out to me because we've had a long, and again, if, if, if people are interested in a little bit more in the branding of an actor, figure out your niche. How do you look? Does it match the way you sound? And can you make more ways? Can you think, you know, I look like a Frenchman. Can I do a French accent? Uh, I look like an Italian guy. Can I do an Italian accent? And so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. I'm a Spanish guy and I've played a few Spanish guys already. So <laughs> it's, right. so you got to, you know, this, these are tools from a marketing point of view right. that you can. And so back in 2014, when I was like, this is moving way too slow. I need to make my own break and I need to produce my own short films to showcase, you know, for my show reel and show people what I can do and then organize workshops that where actors feel empowered and not scared of the casting director because they're not scary when you get to know them. But I always used to be scared shitless when I go to these workshops. So I was like, I need to make, figure it out. So who do I also contact? And Nancy Bishop was a person who works in London and Czech Republic and she casts a lot of American films that 
um, one, have American roles, and two, uh, have Eastern European roles. So like, this is the perfect person for me to contact. I reached out to her. She's like, yeah, sure, let's organize workshops together. And um, hmm. I organized some workshops for her throughout the years, you know, when she would look for Bulgarian or Russian speaking actors, she would reach out to me and I would, you know, give her some suggestions um, all for free. Like I'm doing it just because I want to, you know what I mean? Right, like, right. And then when I, and for Borat, I was living in Beverly Hills at the time. Uh, and I got, she was like, we didn't even know what the movie was for a long time uh, after that. But she's like, oh, this big movie, high school musical, whatever. Uh, they're looking for a lead from Eastern Europe, and it's all about her being in high school and being a foreigner. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and she's from a primitive village. Can you find some actresses? In three days, wow. I found 70 actresses to audition for this. 70, s- seven zero. Seven zero. Super obscure fucking thing. Wow. Where they had to learn and uh, make up these crazy monologues about them being from a crazy uh, village from Armenia or whatever. And they mm. were doing these... And I had to explain to them what NDAs are, why they need to sign them, and then, <laughs> yeah. like send me the videos, and I, I had to upload them to this uh, to cast wow. it, and it just and on a different time zone. Um, and I, but I, I worked my ass off. I did it, and uh, and so Maria stood out, and Maria Bakalova stood out, and then they asked her to do another self tape, and then she was actually just graduating drama school, and mm. she was in the middle of shooting a movie in a lead role. Um, and then she was on to shoot another movie in a lead role in Bulgaria. So she already had like three or four movies in leading roles oh. at the age of 22 while oh. graduating drama school and doing a play, a uh, graduation play and all that stuff. And they also produced a play that she um, she made with friends, uh, with their colleagues. But basically, she only had 15 days. So she had, they asked her to fly to London. And she's, she had never flown alone. She had always been flying with her family or friends. Wow. To fly to London to do a screen test with this unknown actor for this unknown production. Didn't even know. So she got on the plane not even knowing yeah, who she was going to be with. Like, granted, it, it sounds a little dodgy, but it was an NDA from whatever company it was with. And I was like, no, no, these are normal things. Like, don't worry about it. And she's like, one night she calls me all like crying in tears and like shaking. And I'm like, what's wrong? And she's like, I know you're not going to tell me if you're a trafficker, but please promise me you guys are not traffickers. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I'm oh, laughing shit. and she's crying seriously. And she's like, oh, I was on, on the phone with my mom for two hours. She's crying as well. She doesn't want to let That's me go. That's insane. I'm like, why? I'm like, okay. She's like, promise me, promise me. I'm like, okay, I promise. I'm not a trafficker. <laughs> and they're not traffickers either. It's a normal thing. And she's like, why would you say that? Even think of such a thing. And she goes, well, because things like these don't happen to people like us. Ooh. And I go, damn, damn, damn. Wow. And then I started crying for real. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and this is why I want to help people. Like, you're like <laughs> it became a love fest, yeah. cry fest. Yeah. And so, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I I helped her out with the, all the auditions. She came back and forth three or four times. They really tortured wow. her before they gave her the part. Thinking about it, it's good that we didn't know what it was because if she had seen, because she saw the first Borat when she was already in America. And... Mm. And I don't know if, if, if once you sign the paperwork, you're like, you have to do it when you're an actor, you just da da da. In retrospect, yeah. now, like if I knew this was, I wouldn't, I, I would be scared to, to audition even for that. Like, because, because I could get cast. <laughs> and what do I do right, then? Like, right. this is scary shit that they did. Right. I mean, forget about it with that miracle happening. Just the idea that this happened. What is, what, what is, the, and, and the success of this, what has this done for Bulgarian actors or just Eastern European actors in general? Like, is there, is, should we be celebrating so much? Because it would be great if a role didn't call for yeah, somebody from the, you know, you Eastern European and, and they, and they were won over by the talent. They kept their accent in the role and they became as successful. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we're still, we're still waiting for that to happen. Yeah. Right, F- fully to fully um, think, integrate in. I think from 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 my point of view, and it's you know she's breaking through with such a specific role that it, it might seem also stereotypical. But what I say to that is, if you felt for her, then she's not a stereotype because you can't feel for stereotypes. You feel for characters That's and people, right. and so 
Uh, and she's the beating heart of the movie. Oh, I think. definitely. But what it's what's great about it is I think we're raising awareness. So we can't really criticize cast and directors or producers for making these uh, shows about Eastern Europe or movies about Eastern Europe and casting all Brits and all all American cast and. You know, the mm-hmm. amount of time Gary Oldman has played a, a, a Russian baddie or Kenneth Branagh. And, and they're doing great. But, uh, you know, that's also... And it's never about the actor. It's it's about the decision makers and the writers. And and can we can we have uh, a, a movie where a person is, is, is from Bulgaria or Poland or Greece or da-da-da and it's not about their nationality and they don't fit that stereotype... Uh, of a cleaner or a, a mobster or um, one of those, you know, limiting uh, hoodie number one, hoodie number two. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think the industry is kind of learning about it and it's responding to it, um, especially in the last five years with uh, with kind of the, the, the raise of awareness about diversity and like, look, we're part of, like there's so many uh, different people with different backgrounds and sexualities and, uh, uh, and all that stuff that uh, that deserve to be seen, and you know, and those characters are part of our lives, and they need to exist within those written worlds that we watch. And so, uh, I'm, you know, what's great about Maria's next few movies is, you know, she she keeps booking, and they keep a pre- it's, she's not a one trick pony, as you know, she's had a career, yeah. she's already one of the most successful actresses in Bulgaria, even before she auditioned for Borat, as yeah. I said. But the point is, like. Can we have lead actors who have accents like Gal Gadot or Aza Pataki or, uh, you know, Antonio Banderas? We, we have some, uh, Olga Kurlenko, we have some, you know, Aza Gonzalez. If you want, like, they might have an accent, but it's never referenced in the movie. And that's, or right. not referenced in a silly way. Um, yeah. You don't have to explain why they exist in this world because they do. You know, Eastern right. Europe is home right. to 300 million people. It's the biggest geo-ethnic right. region in Europe. And mm-hmm. 4%, I think, of the UK population is expats from Eastern Europe. And mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. we see on TV uh, uh, is, you know, one or two lines and mostly in a negative light. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think we need to raise awareness about that. And when, whenever there's roles with positive connotations, it's kind of not played by us and we're not even seen for those. So I think mm-hmm. that is changing. So I think it's an exciting time. Eventually my acting career picked up after not working for two years and I did a bunch of small TV jobs that are really interesting and cool and um, and onto Berlin Station, which uh, I did this really uh, awesome assassin, Spetsnaz, they gave like, and this is one of those, you know, when you, when you show up and you're professional and you bring a little bit more than is what, you know, I always try to do something opposite or create, like the audition for that, like it was, I was getting uh, annoyed at the industry again for a second. And then, uh, oh, I'm like, okay, another one that I'm, uh, I'm not going to book. It's a 40 year old with a thick neck and, and eyes that scream mm-hmm. daggers and murder. And I'm like, it's not me. Um, right. And so I had this four, super short scene and I had to turn it around in a day and I was like, Ugh. and also in Russian language, which I don't speak, but it's very similar to Bulgarian. So kind of, I work with a friend and, or a coach and they, so anyway, I do this scene where I have to tell this kid that it's, everything's okay, but I just literally murdered, murdered her brother in the previous scene. But instead of being scary and all that, and I play that idea, I just did the opposite and I played it like the nice big brother and i was like oh and like i touch her cheek and i smile at her yeah. and then seven days later i was already approved by you know paramount or whatever uh and epics and i got the role and i played it that way you know he's a manipulative son of a bitch he's right. not necessarily but then he turns on the psycho eyes and he's scary all of a sudden but he manipulates people he uses his charms it's not stereotypical anymore <laughs> i remember the director on the first episode when we did that scene with the kid and he's, uh, he was like, wow, I thought to myself, what a nice killer. <laughs> he's German. <laughs> and he's like, okay. I said, you like that kind of direction I went? He's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, great. So, you know, great director. And, uh, you know, so I, they, they wrote me in the show like in four more episodes. And then they, That's they had to kill me off because uh, one of the characters, 
the, the actor who played the lead character, his contract was, <laughs> he was leaving the show, so they had to kill him off. And so oh. they exchanged me for him. I was like, God damn it. I, I, I was going to have my first 10 <laughs> episodes in a season. Now I have to die. And they're like, don't worry. We've oh. r- written you a four minute monologue where you kill yourself. I don't know if you've seen wow. that on Berlin Station, but no, I haven't. it's I have a to check it out. sick monologue that my origin story kind of thing um, with Leland Orser and his fucking brilliant actor. And Th- this is that what's exciting about about Netflix, particularly, and mm-hmm. we'll talk about Chat yeah. on Bone now yeah. because uh, because there is a lot of international films and TV, particularly TV shows, that seem to be seeping into uh, particularly Netflix. Yeah, and that are taking over like people are seeing them on the same level yeah. as stuff that's done here yeah and um and i see a future for that like there's a reason to be optimistic yeah well you about see even that. like with game of thrones it's like all shot in europe right or uh, and mostly right european 95 percent right. european actors right and people are i just checked star meter game of thrones is still in top 10 most watched things every isn't week amazing. isn't that crazy so amazing. i hope that's kind of the hope i think for every new fantasy show they're making, but I think Shadow and Bone, because I've seen it and it's so good, man. Like, and not and I, as a fantasy geek and a sci-fi geek, yeah, I, yeah. I would have been all over that if even if I wasn't an actor or an actor in it. Um, even if I didn't get a role, I would still be like, oh my god, yeah. it's really good, and the cast is so amazing. Um, like, those kids are just just phenomenal. And, and what's your part? What's your part in this? I play Fedor Kaminsky. It's like a supporting character. He's like in five or six eps out of eight. And uh, he um, he's kind of a bigger part in the second book, in the second series. But he's a heart render, so he stops hearts. And uh, I got to do some action as well, uh, which was fun and like stop some hearts. And it's pretty brutal. And dodge some imaginary arrows. <gasps> <laughs> and, uh, and then you look super cool on screen. I was like, <laughs> we had this crazy one shot scene, uh, which was like the Revenant style, uh, like a series mm. of one shots in the forest mm-hmm. where we, and I was like, when should I dodge it? And he's like, yeah, the camera goes around the tree at this moment. And you kind of have to figure it out. And like you're wearing these wonky boots and you're like, I hope I don't twist my ankle, right. but it's great. And then he, the character himself is kind of like, you know, as I told you, I, I just have to, because I'm used to having guest stars and recurring and like having to to i've worked with a lot of famous people and a lot of stars on shows so i i know that i will probably they will probably get 10 takes and i'll probably get one or two i really have to be on it because you know we did this show with rob lowe in london um wild bill where i play the suspect and uh, he's a he's a cop and then he's dragging me through the streets of Boston, Lincolnshire, the original Boston, <laughs> and, uh, in in the UK, and and we do it, you know, in this the 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 mid shot that favors him, and then there's his cowboy shot, and then it's the mid close, <laughs> and then the close up, <laughs> and so and I use that to just try different things and find my best way to do it because I know, mm. and literally, sure sure enough, like we had 10 minutes till we had to end the day and the 10, these 10 minutes I had to give like three straight back to back performance. Like, and I'm emotional. I'm the one who's emotional in the scene. I'm beat up. I'm crying. Yeah. And all of a sudden some fucking kids start banging on poles and like making whistling noises. And even he was like, what the fuck is going on? Like it was him who'd stopped. I'm used to it, like distractions and right. I know I have to keep running. Like no matter, right. you know, maybe I'm not even getting to the emotion, but I, I can't judge myself. I only have two takes. There's three minutes. Mm. They're pulling the plug. So it's that conditioning that I have. And also like even so minutely like thinking about everything uh, and trying, and I like to try different things most of the time, every different take and until I kind of get a ballpark of it. And, and I still try within that. But um, I think that's, what, on Shadow and Bone, I I had done this thing for the audition. They didn't even expect that change because it was a double joke on the same like <laughs> like serious mm. joking, serious joking. But the second one wasn't written in. I just saw the opportunity for it on the page mm. within a scene with five lines, four lines. Yeah, I saw that, and they were like laughing so hard, and they're like, "We didn't even 
we didn't we didn't even think of that that's crazy <laughs> and i was like i knew i i got the role at that point yeah but it's yeah. stuff like that that i kind of try to put in every performance that i make and and make it more you know never play oh he's a killer no he's like he can also be a goofball he can also yeah. like so yeah. Pedro is a little bit of a you know um um a softer presence sometimes like a uh, like a comedic sort of uh, you know high stakes but then he's like joking it's like a bit of a marvel mm-hmm. performance let's say mm-hmm. where you know thor's mom got killed and then he's making a joke two minutes later while fighting the bad guy in the subway so it's that kind of <laughs> <laughs> walking yeah. that fine line um yeah. but he's he's very complex and we did the reshoots with ben barnes where we had a couple of scenes together and we we knew that it wasn't an, an there were more expositional scenes, but we we're like within these few lines, we have to show our relationship because um, mm. it's the first time our characters interact, and we had to think, you know, how people interact with him throughout the show, and and you mm-hmm. know my goofiness that I bring to things that he hasn't seen that I've done, and we kind of yeah, and that's what's great with you know working with awesome, talented, generous professionals that you kind of work it out together, so. You can really see our relationship when when we watched it and we talked to each other. And it's like you can really see that relationship without it being on the page necessarily. Right. right. And we kept joking on set that, uh, <laughs> uh, except for Ben, who's very famous, but basically and, and very good, but nobody else is kind of known on the show. Uh, and it's like, yeah, that's why you got good actors because we're unknown. <laughs> Coming back to, to rooting for people, it, it comes from this realization I had some years ago where I, I auditioned for Treadstone uh, for J.R. Bentley. Uh, so the Treadstone is uh, based on the um, Jason Bourne novel. So they did um, a TV series a couple of years ago. And, um, and when I saw it, the brief was American accent, but he looks like an Eastern European because he's a spy in 1970s Berlin. I was like, shit, that's my, it's one shot. You only get one chance to blow. (laughs) That's that bullshit again in my head. Yeah. And I did one of the most phenomenal auditions I've ever made. And then you can see on Vimeo, it got watched by 10, 11 people. And normally it just gets watched by your agent. (laughs) And and the cast director ones. And then they download it and you don't know what. It got watched by a lot of people. And I didn't even make the the short list because I wasn't of, my profile wasn't big enough. I was like, fuck. Fuck, man. Um, and then I heard that um, uh, Jeremy Irvine booked it. And I was like, I got annoyed for a second. And then, and then I was like, that I, that I didn't book it because I heard from, yeah, I heard it from the internet. And, uh, and then at the second moment, I was like, you know what? And it was kind of one of those weird breakthroughs again. If I do believe really that I have all of humanity in me that, and that I'm God and this is my universe and you're God and I'm a projection of you and you're a projection of me and we're all the same, then I should imagine I'm Jeremy right now and hearing the news from my agent and really mm. feel happy that I booked the role as if I'm him mm. and him is me and I'm him, like that kind of con- <laughs> craziness. Yeah. And since then, I kid you not, it's been three years now, I have not felt the um, feeling of envy or wow. even jealousy. And I, I always kind of wow. celebrate as if I, I got it, because I did. Wow. And another version of me got it. So it's like a little, and it, we talked about, it's all about tricking your brain. And and I think yes. I just try to walk through life with that kind of openness and, and just be happy for people, because why the fuck shouldn't I be? You know what I mean? Unless, you know, you, and, and I met the guy and we had a scene together and he's awesome. Mm. And, and if, mm-hmm. like, and he, he didn't do anything to me. Like, I'm, this is a race between me and me. So right. how can I lose it as, lo- as long as I'm showing up? Right. What is your game plan now? You know, LA, London, Bulgaria, like right now you're in Bulgaria. What What is your game plan about where you feel like you need to be? Or is that even important anymore? Is it is it, thing, is it yeah. is it a whole new world about like you don't have to be planted somewhere? I think that's it. I think you're right on the money with that one because I just, especially the, the pandemic in so many ways and so many uh, fields and professions and sectors, it's just moved along the industries four or five years ahead where we would have been. So, mm. so much of it is Zoom callbacks and self-dapes um, that I, 
I don't even need a person to read in. Like normally you need your buddy to read with you. Now I just Zoom with someone because mm. that made it so accessible that they just read with me. When I was like, are you free? Okay, cool. I, I put some chairs up and then some pillows mm. and I have you on my island that I need and I have my yeah. kit everywhere. My blue backdrop, my my lights well, and my, my thing. Yeah. I don't care where, I like for me as well, like that I've, I've struggled, like I love London. Lon- I'm a Londoner. London is the, the city that made me. Um, an artist and a grown up and a man and all that stuff and a cosmopolitan person. Uh, it's opened my mind and my heart so much that, but also like, I don't want to live there anymore. Like I'm 31 now, 32 soon. I've kind of paid my dues and mm. I just kind of have to, you know, I, I don't want to, I want to live somewhere. For me, it's important to have sun. So Los Angeles was a, you know, a great place, but. Uh, a great option, but it's just so far away from all the people that I, I love. And I have a lot of friends mm-hmm. that I care for, but obviously it's just LA can feel a little lonely sometimes. I still feel like I need to live in a big city like that in Los Angeles. I have this fantasy about New York as well, because I've never been. And I feel like I'm really going to enjoy it for a couple of years. But yes. now that work is moving me around so much, there's really no p- point for me to spend stupid money on renting a studio in New York or LA or London, um, I'm actually thinking of maybe buying a place in Madrid um, and living there with my sister because she's moving there to, she's studying, doing her master's and she's mm. like nine years younger than me. So we're at this point where we're kind of reconnecting now as adults mm. and mm-hmm. it's beautiful. And I just really want to spend time with, with her and more and more time with my, you know, the twenties is when you kind of separate from your parents. And now I just kind of yeah. spend more time with my grandparents and my parents and, yeah. and friends and, and Bulgaria is actually a really lovely place to live. And the weather is mostly great, except for the winter months. But now it's like I had a super summer last year. Uh, and I'm from a seaside um, town, Varna. It's like mm. half a million people. And like I just have my friends from childhood there. And it's just really fun. It's been really fun coming back to Bulgaria for to spend a year here. And I've just been traveling. I went to Vancouver to shoot reshoots for Shadow and Bone. And then I went to... Um, London to shoot um, Temple for a month and a half. Mm-hmm. So basically, I, I I would travel anyway to to some yeah. really cool places. I just probably want to base myself somewhere warm and with good food and good quality of life and air. Yeah, because I think more and more I'm paying attention to my health, keeping and, yourself happy. Yeah, and keeping myself because why else would I be doing anything? Like I think my whole thing is about living open, happy, and and. You know, try and make sense. That's of helping life. your instrument. Yeah, like if I'm not distressed, I can act. <laughs> yeah, Julian Kostov, thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> thank you, brother. Back to one is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of the Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.